As we look at, we get to start in terms of uh, putting a context on it. What we're going to do is first of all look at uh, what our experience to date is connecting embedded devices to the internet. And it's not really a very good one. Uh, I'm going to use one particular example, which is the 2016 Dyne cyber attack. Um, so, this happened on the 21st of uh, October, uh, just last year. And it was an unprecedented cyber attack. Um, when they, it's three, three separate ways, each lasting about two hours, and it pretty much took down the internet. So each each wave is about two hours. It's a morning, uh, it's morning, early morning, middle of the day, and, and an afternoon. And it took down pretty much all the marquee names on the internet: Airbnb, Amazon, Netflix, Spotify, CNN, Wall Street Journal. I mean, you name it, and they were impacted by this particular attack. Um, and what was behind the attack was a massive denial of service. Millions of infected Internet of Things devices ramming the internet, mainly targeted against North America, as you can see there. And, and when they analyzed it to figure out what was behind it, it was this Myra. Myra was a botnet, uh, or is a botnet, it's uh, Japanese for the future and it's supposedly named after this anime TV series. Uh, it was open source several weeks beforehand. And what it does is it actually infects IoT devices. So these are uh, largely in the attack itself was actually IP cameras, uh, home routers and baby models. And the when they went to try and figure out what was behind this attack, it wasn't it wasn't the Russians. Uh, it wasn't industrial espionage or anything like that. It was more than likely that the general acceptance is that it was script kiddies proving that they could do it. Uh, which is a pretty frightening kind of a prospect that the Internet of Things has the ability to actually take down the Internet. Um, when we look at it, we really kind of have to see here that there's a market failure going on. Um, the people who sold the IP cameras, many of them several years old, and the people who bought them weren't impacted by the attack. Manufacturers putting software, Linux software, um, not paying any real attention to actually the security of the devices, um, putting them out on the market, they're being purchased. That's their economic interest is done now at this stage. Uh, users are buying them, they're installing them. In an interesting twist, baby monitors and IP cameras were put in for security devices into people's homes. Um, but they continued to work, even when the, the attack was going on, so they weren't impacted by this. Uh, the ISPs, or the people who connect all these devices to the internet, they're also got really no, not much economic interest in to solve this problem. Uh, they could potentially squash these types of attacks, but there's no much charge for doing that. So what you've left with is what the economists call economic externality. The people who are going to get, who are actually the, the victims of this attack, are going to be the ones who are going to have to fund it. Um, and that results in us, all of us, paying for an after-the-fact security market to try and protect ourselves from the currently millions of devices and more millions of devices that are going to be connected to the, the internet. Um, and the reality is that security is expensive. Apple, Google, Microsoft spend a tremendous amount of money to try and build secure things that they can put to um, And to keep them patched and keep them up to date. Their life is made slightly simpler by the fact that the things that they are putting out there actually have a limited life cycle. Um, take fridges. Don't expect to turn it over every two years the same way as a smartphone. So, as I say, this is, this is really a market failure. Um, and it's going to be left to the regulators to try and figure out how to fix this problem. And they will have to fix it, and the regulations may, may, may not be good regulations. Uh, they're also probably going to start finding people. Recently, uh, D-Link, who was one of the home routers involved in the dying attack, uh, has been fined by the FTC. The FTC. Now, the FTC uh, may not get any money from it because D-Link will dispute it on for a while. And really, this economics really doesn't work, and I'm saying. Um, 
security and costs, someone's going to have to pay for it. We need to look at how the IoT is actually going to pay for its security. So I'm going to move next, actually to a much more positive one, which is really what IoT is about. Really what IoT is about this transformation, about this vision of the future of a connected world. And it's really about digital transformation, the enablement of digital transformation. That's actually really exciting, what's going on in that, that space. And to try and help you understand actually what it's about, I'm going to use a couple of examples. Two companies who we in Azavi were involved with when they, they started their journey. And digital transformation is a journey. It's a, quite a, a lengthy, long journey, filled with collaborations. because nobody can do it all by themselves. And in the first example, it's uh, Earthmoves. This company, um, which is really a household name, um, have an extraordinary vision of their future. Uh, born somewhat out of paranoia, uh, they don't want to be Ubered, and that's their own term. And uh, what they mean by that, they don't want to be disaggregated. So they manufacture these big, big earth moving vehicles, power plants, various other things. They're all in the field, um, and what they don't want to be is they don't want to just feed some needs to some, somebody's other, someone else's digital system. So they're determined to create their own future for themselves. And it starts with sensors on their vehicles, uh, connected back to their headquarters. Uh, where their designers are, and feeding the information that comes live off their systems, off the, the, the remote access that they've got in the fields, like tens of thousands of earth movers, into algorithms to try and figure out what's going on. And that enables them to automatically predict failures. So they might have a machine that develops a, a vibration, and that vibration is, is probably going to cause, cause a failure. Their systems, through their algorithms, can determine that that's about to happen. And what they'll do is, they'll actually automatically start triggering their supply chain to start making corrective actions. And interestingly, if you talk to these guys and see what they're doing, they, they've always been connected, actually, to their, their, their devices. But they've been manually connected. And what IoT and the digital transformation happens is it means that they can do that much, much faster. So from automatic signals, these guys are able to take the feeds and reads that come from the sensors through a connection into an al algorithms to trigger their supply chain. And actually, so the IoT actually is, is end to end, and it's necessarily end to end, that vision actually, whereby the triggers go into the supply chain, and the supply chain then mobilizes the workforce to go and respond. And the, the workforce, interestingly enough, is, is, is actually as, in, as interesting and probably as integral to IoT, uh, connecting the, the, the field force as it is the actual sensors themselves. Uh, and they're able to outcompete the, the guys who could potentially Uber them, um, and also massively compete against uh, whoever their competition would be. And collaboration, if you look at these guys, I mean, they're, they're quite inspiring, really. Collaboration is absolutely at the heart of what they need to do. The second example um, is uh, different from the point of view of their business, but it's the exact same idea. It's the same it's kind of a journey. Um, they are a coffee retail outlet, and they began their uh, IoT journey uh, with their maintenance uh, guys. So their maintenance guys were having great difficulties trying to get out to fix machines when they needed to be uh, fixed. And if you're if you're a retailer and your coffee machine is not working, then you're not doing any business. Um, and some of these uh, outlets that they have are quite quite difficult to get to places from the perspective of maintenance. So if you're in behind the security of the airport and you need to get in to try and fix a machine and you've got a bag of tools, it's hard enough to get in when you don't have a bag of tools. Uh, so these guys actually, in their maintenance department, made a really simple gadget. They connected it um, back to themselves and they, they tried it with 10, 10, 10 outlets. Um, and they're doing very simple stuff. They're literally just counting how many cups of coffee there are. Uh, or actually how many, how many dispensers are coming off the machine. And using that to determine when the next maintenance is due. And that dramatically reduces the number of people they have in the field. They started with 10, discovered that it worked. They've now deployed 30,000 and growing sites with sensors connected back to themselves. And of course, the finance guys find out, found out that all the machines and sensors, and the maintenance guy knew more about how much coffee was being born than the finance guys, and the journey continues. And they then get to the bank and say, well, actually, we're going to use those fields, we're going to build them into our, our financial systems. We're trying to figure out how much coffee we need, and how, where do we need to put in more, more, more coffee machines. 
And really, when you look at the IoT in this context, which is actually a very, you know, that's where the innovation is going to happen. And actually, for somebody like myself who works on the side of actually creating the secure connectivity, the real innovation for IoT, including for the guys doing that, algorithms and analytics and all those other things, it really comes alive when you get into the, the, the domain specifics of particular businesses and particular markets. It's quite exciting to deal with like this. Um, but if we look at their um, uh, experience or their, their use of IoT, security in this perspective is completely different. Um, they, So, the, so from a security point of view, these guys have a totally different uh, outlook in terms of what security means for them. Uh, all the data coming off the field, coming into the predictive maintenance, if they can't trust that data, there's no one feeding it into their analytics systems and mobilizing their, their, their supply chain. If they're, they've got devices and they're vulnerable, and most devices are vulnerable, certainly embedded devices are, and they get compromised, that's their business of their business. To a large extent, a lot of this is about, you know, trying to reduce time to time and increase competitive advantage. The last thing you want is this system to be insecure in any in any part of it. Um, so the then come back to this this idea that apart from anything else, and I put it up there end-to-end digitally integrated. That this vision of IoT is necessarily end-to-end. -end. It's a it's a rather grand vision of IoT. But it's, a, it's an IoT that spans the far reaches of the business. It's, it's the one side of it is the devices and the things connected back to the business, through the analytics, through the supply chain, and then back to the other side where you've got your field forces mobilized to drive maintenance of these machines that are in the field. Um, and it's hard, it's actually very hard to do this, uh, and it requires collaboration and lots of innovation. Um, but it's also required to be um, based on trust. Um, and if you look at the security economics of this, as I say, um, um, we come back to this now and then, the IoT, right, the Internet of Things. And in an interesting way, it's actually, we kind of assume that there are things connected to the Internet. And that's what the first wave of IoT was, was things connected to the Internet. We've already seen that you can't do that. And actually, the IoT in this vision is not connecting things to the internet because it's not a good place to connect them. It's like your IT systems, Th those predictive maintenance systems, your customer databases, they're not connected to the internet. At least not directly connected, they have to be isolated from the internet. And it's the same for the things. The machines that go out into the field, the field forces that are out in the field, they actually can't be connected to the internet. So actually they have to be connected to the internet. And I think for anybody who's looking at their IoT journey and they actually think that the Internet of Things is about connecting things to the Internet. It's not. It's about connecting things behind the Internet where they're nice and safe and away from the Internet. So I'll leave you with the Internet of Things is about not connected to the Internet. Okay. Thanks very much.